the last speaker of today and the last speaker of this uh, session is uh, Paolo Piccione from USP. And he's going to talk about multiple solutions for a higher order variational problem in conformal geometry. Thank you very much. I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak at this session and for the nice work they've done. So let's see. Um, this is the um, subject of my talk. I want to discuss with you a problem of finding many solutions for a fourth order uh, variational problem that arises in uh, conformal geometry, which has many analogies with the uh, Yamabe problem. So um, this is more or less the outline of my talk. I will talk to you about this Q curvature and the Pinitz operator. Uh, and I f will first introduce it uh, in, uh, in the space Rn and then uh, discuss its extension to Riemannian geometry. And uh, then in the second part of my talk, I will, uh, oops, I will, uh, okay, I will first start to learn how this thing, this device work. Yeah, okay. So then I will tell you about these multiplicity results. And, and then I will give you some examples, okay? Before I do that, I want to uh, make some acknowledgments. So these are my, uh, my co-authors, Renato Betiot from UPenn. Yannick Sir from John, Johns Hopkins, and these are my sponsors. So pretty much this, is, uh, this resumes uh, more or less my life as a researcher. You have to convince the uh, funding agencies that you have a nice problem, and then you have to convince your friends to uh, work with you in this. Uh, <laughs> spam? spam? What do you mean? <laughs> no, no, this is, this is the most important slide of my talk, so I wanted to discuss it. <laughs> Uh, and I also apologize, I have some uh, back problems, so I need to, to be seated most of the time. Um, okay, let me uh, tell you a little bit about this problem. I'm getting inspiration from a nice introduction by uh, Gursky. So, um, you have sub-11 embeddings. Uh, H2 of Rn is embedded into L uh, to that power, 2n divided by n minus 4. Uh, for n greater than or equal to 5, and this embedding is uh, only continuous, is non-compact, okay? So in particular, that means that if you want to take the L2 norm of the Laplacian, that is greater than or equal to uh, some constant time, the L 2n over n minus 4 uh, norm of the square norm of the function u, okay? And the best constant for this, uh, for this inequality is known, and this is studied by several papers, in the, mostly in the 80s, Lyons, Edmunds, Fortunato, Iannelli, okay? And what is known about this is that uh, the function that realizes this best constant is as a radial function, and it satisfies this equation here involving the square Laplacian. So the square Laplacian of u is u to this power here which happens to be, by the way, this number plus one. Um, it's, it is also known that this, um, um, that functions u that minimize, well, um, this is the Euler-Lagrange equation for some functional. And uh, the minimizers of these functionals are positive. But the best thing is that uh, this equation is conformally invariant. That is, the set of solutions is invariant by translations, uh, dilations, that is, if you take a positive constant t, uh, then uh, uh, this function, if u is a solution of this equation, also this function here is a solution of the, for this equation. And also inversions, which is given by this formula here, okay? So this means that, uh, that this equation is conformally invariant, okay? And so it's a natural question to ask whether there exists an analogous operator in, in Riemannian manifolds, okay? So what we want is conformal invariance and, and positive uh, minimizers for, for, the, for, the, uh, mm, for the equation. And, uh, okay, the answer is yes, there exists such an operator. And... Um, this theorem is due to Pinetz from 1983. If you take a manifold, if you take any Riemannian manifold of dimension greater than or equal to 5, 
there exists a fourth order differential operator, PG, depending on the metric G, of course, which is of the type, okay, it's uh, square, it's the square of the Laplacian, and plus it has lower order terms, uh, terms of order less than or equal to two. I will show you an exact uh, uh, definition for this operator in a second. For the moment, it's not important. Uh, the good thing is, uh, about this operator is that um, if you take the operator P associated to a conformal metric and you apply it to some function, then uh, you get this expression here. So this is a conformally invariant operator. Okay. Um, what's not clear is if... Um, Minimizer for the associated quadratic functional are positive, and that is a problem, and I will tell you uh, in a second about this. So examples for Rn, it's just the square of the Laplacian. By the way, my Laplacian is, uh, of course, the natural Laplacian. It's minus divergence of the gradient, so. So there is a minus sign, so it has a positive spectrum, okay, just in case. Because I noticed that in, in a previous conference, uh, they used a different convention for the sign. For the sphere, it is also a product. It is the Laplacian times the Laplacian minus a constant. It is just this, okay. Very, okay. Um, let me tell you uh, more precisely what this operator looks like. So you take your manifold. Uh, and, okay, you define a Q curvature, which is, okay, this complicated expression, okay. There is a Laplacian of the scalar curvature. There is a norm square of the Ricci tensor. And there is a square of the, of the scalar curvature. And then there are some constants here, nasty constants, depending on the dimension, okay. You want to see what the, these constants are. This is Cn, this is Dn, and this is En, okay. Something not very intuitive. Uh, and the Panitz operator, oops, is, uh, okay, is the square of the Laplacian plus some constant times, okay, divergence of the Ricci tensors, and this is a local orthonormal frame. Then there is divergence of scalar curvature times the gradient. And the zero order term is the Q curvature. Okay, these are the values of the constant here. Um, so you understand that this is kind of a, a tough object to work with. But if you happen to choose a metric which is, uh, which is uh, Einstein, then this is just the metric, constant multiple of the metric. So the divergence of this becomes just a Laplacian. Okay, and if you also take the scalar curvature to be constant, then here you have another Laplacian, you see? So in the very special case that you have an Einstein manifold with constant scalar curvature, this is just a polynomial, a second order polynomial in the Laplacian. Um, well, you use this operator to make a variational problem, in fact. This corresponds to the, to the conformal Laplacian in dimension two. So, okay, this is it. Okay. Um, so it's a natural problem now that you have uh, something which is conformal invariant to ask yourself, like in the Yamabe problem, uh, the following question. So you fix a metric G0, and you want to find in the conformal class of this metric something which has constant Q curvature. So uh, you write your conformal factor with this power here, um, and you want to solve this equation here. This is the uh, constant Q curvature equation. Um, Panet's operator applied to U is lambda times uh, a power of U. And if you solve this equation, then uh, the corresponding lambda will give you the, the curvature of the conformal factor by this formula here, okay? 
This is a, okay, finding, as in the case of uh, the Yamabe problem, the um, matrix with constant uh, Q curvature can be characterized as critical points for the quadratic functional associated to the uh, uh, Pinitz operator, restricted to uh, the, let's say, unit ball in this space here, okay? And this is, now you understand why I was looking at the embedding of H2 into this L2 space. Because now you understand that this is a hard problem to solve in general, like the Yamabe problem. You don't have necessarily minimizers under this condition because the inclusion of, okay, this uh, function is defined well in H2. If you integrate by parts, you have basically, this is the integral of the square of the Laplacian plus some lower order terms. So this is defined in H2. And, uh, and you, take the, you take this variational problem on the unit ball of this space here, okay? So um, the problem here is that uh, uh, since you have a non-compact embedding, you, ha you have minimizing sequences for this function can converge weakly to zero and they give bubbling, like uh, the problem that uh, Sergio was talking about, okay? And there's also another bad problem, which is the minimizer for, um, for this functional here, they uh, may not be positive functions, which means that they don't define a conformal class, okay? Unlike the second order case. This depends on the fact that there is no maximum principle for fourth order elliptic operator. So you can have a linear fourth order elliptic operator um, whose uh, uh, first eigenspace uh, consists of functions that do not have a sign, okay? You can make very easy examples of this happen. Okay. So let me make a uh, comparison between uh, the Yamabe problem and the constant Q curvature problem. Okay. So you have, in both cases, you have non-compact embeddings. You have, in the case of Yamabe problem, you have H1 into uh, this space L2n over n minus 2. Uh, here you have H2 into L2n over n minus 4. Okay. These are exactly the critical exponents for the two embeddings. Uh, then you have a conformally invariant operator. In the case of the Yamabe problem, you have the conformal Laplacian, which is this. Remember there, we have a conventional sign with this. And in the case of Q curvature, you have the Pinitz operator. The, the natural curvature associated to the conformal invariant operators is the scalar curvature in this case. So if you take this conformal uh, metric, then the scalar curvature is uh, given by this expression. So having constant scalar curvature will give you the, an equation of the type uh, conformal Laplacian of u equals uh, lambda times u to the n plus 2 over n minus 2. And on the other side, you have a similar expression. So the, the, the curvature notion associated to this conformal invariant operator is the Q curvature. And if you write the conformal um, metric in this form, then this is the Q curvature, okay? So here we know that minimizers uh, for the quadratic function always exist. And they always are, uh, they're always attained on a positive function. So you always have a positive answer to the Yamabe problem. You can always find a metric in, in a conformal class having constant scalar curvature. But here, nothing is known. So uh, you don't know whether minimizers exist, and you don't know whether they're positive. Um, but if, if by any chance uh, you find a positive minimizer, then that gives you a metric with, pos with constant uh, Q coverage, OK? And very little is known about the existence of positive minimizers. Most results deal only with the case when both the scalar curvature is positive and uh, the uh, Q curvature is almost positive, that is non-negative and positive at some point, okay? There exist very few results only dealing with this very special case, okay? So what we want to do is just uh, really uh, compute examples. We want to see how bad is the situation, how bad is the failure of the lack of, of a maximum principle. So this is the idea of our work, just uh, computing examples, okay? Um, so uh, you know that uh, we, you have some um, uh, 
a Yamabe, uh, it's, uh, there is a Yamabe invariant of a conformal class, uh, which is defined in terms of this quadratic function here. Remember that this is the conformal Laplacian, this is the Panitz operator. So let's look at these two cases. Left side Yamabe, right side Panitz, okay? Uh, so, well, no, so left side on the first line, sorry. Um, so the Yamabe invariant is the uh, infimum of the quadratic function divided, normalized by this uh, LP norm, okay? This is the Yamabe invariant of a conformal class. And uh, for this object here, there are several invariants. It's not clear which one is the best one. One is simply you take the same object. That is, uh, you take the infimum of the quadratic function normalized by this uh, LP norm. But we know that the minimizers uh, may not be positive functions. So you define another invariant, which is the infimum over only positive functions. Okay. And of course, um, the uh, right-hand side is in general greater than, uh, than this, because you're taking infimum over a smaller set of functions, OK? There is a nice theorem by Gursky, Han, and Lin of last year that says that, um, oops, I'm sorry. If you have constant sky curvature and, uh, const and positive Q curvature, I'm sorry, the Q curvature, then these two objects, in fact, are the same. And, um, and so the infimum is attained, and you really have a, a, a function with a, a positive constant Q curvature in a conformal class. Okay? But you need two basic assumptions, positive scale curvature and positive Q curvature. Sorry, there's a mistake here. Um, if you. OK, this is kind of a hard condition because uh, you want at the same time the scalar curvature and the Q curvature to be positive. But this is really not a good condition. What you would like to have is conditions on these, uh, on these invariant. Uh, um, so you want, you want to know something about the infimum of, of, uh, of um, this quadratic function and the infimum of the uh, Yamabe invariant. So, a better theorem would involve not the, the scalar curvature and the Q curvature, but r rather these invariants, Y4 and Y, okay? But nothing is known in this case. So it, it is not known whether the same result can be uh, obtained when you uh, have the um, weaker assumption that Y4 and Y is positive. Uh, it is known that Y positive implies the existence of a metric with positive scalar curvature. But it's not known whether Y4 positive implies the existence of a metric with positive Q curvature. This is not known. Okay? So, but then also Gursky and uh, Han and Lin had this idea which works, and it's, to me it's kind of mysterious. You know that there is a no bound inequality for the Yamabe uh, constant. That is, if you. Uh, take the uh, minimum of the Yamabe functional over all, uh, on any manifold of dimension and on any metric, then this is less than or equal than the value that the same functional has on this, the round sphere of the same dimension. Okay? Um, now, uh, Gursky, Han, and Lin have found that something similar happens um, to. In the case where you have, OK, this is a good condition, y positive and q almost positive. Then in this case, they prove that, in fact, p is now an invertible operator, and it's positive. So it has a green function, which is also positive. This is the first result. And so you can define the inverse by taking an integral operator using this green function. And you associate the quadratic functional to this green function. And you define a new invariant, which is now this quadratic, this quadratic function uh, normalized by this L2 norm. But now, it's, now you take the supremum of this. So you take the inverse uh, Pilot's operator, and then, and then you take the supremum of this. This looks very, very much like the inverse of y4. But, but it's very hard to prove that these two things are the same. And now what happens is that. Um, this supremum now it is always attained, and the, the corresponding function is positive, and it defines a metric with a constant Q curvature. Not only that, but now uh, you have a, 
an inequality exactly the other way around. So now the spheres are the ones that minimize this, uh, uh, this uh, new invariant here, theta. It is very mysterious to me how come things work for this object and don't work for P. After all, one is the inverse of the other. But that's the way things are. OK, so uh, this is what we had in the literature when we started our problem. And uh, so we ha I can give you now a first theorem uh, of existence. So now you take a sphere. You take a sphere of dimension k n. And you remove it, a sphere of dimension k with k. Oops, I'm sorry. There's a mistake here. Uh, this is the other way around. Sorry. You take a sphere of, of dimension k, k less than n. You take the round metric here. OK, of course, when you remove sk, so you remove an equator. OK? And so the round, uh, the round metric is no longer complete, of course. Right? So you ask yourself whether there are some complete metrics that are conformal to the round sphere and that have constant Q curvature in this manifold here. OK? And um, we proved that there is infinitely many now. OK? Let me show you the proof. OK, there is a nice computation that tells you, OK, here we use geometry, actually. Um, because it's, it's very hard to use analysis for this type of problem. So you, you may want to use geometric arguments for these things. OK, you first observe that uh, uh, a sphere Sn minus Sk, this is conformally equivalent to a product of a sphere in a hyperbolic space. There is a nice computation that shows this, but I, have no I don't have time to show it to you. And then you compute um, the scalar curvature and the Q curvature of this product. OK, first of all, this already gives you a solution to this problem, because the product metric here has constant Q curvature, and evidently it's complete. OK? And it's in the same conformal class. You, conform, you um, compute the scalar curvature, and you compute the Q curvature, and they give you these numbers. And when k satisfies this inequality, this double inequality with uh, the correct one here, then these two numbers are positive. OK? And then there is a topological argument that I'll, I'll, show, that I'll show you in the next slide. Let me show you the next slide. So the topological argument is like this. You have a hyperbolic space, and um, the hyperbolic spaces have this property of having lots of compact quotients. For instance, the hyperbolic plane has quotients that are given by, by um, hyperbolic surfaces. Hyperbolic uh, surfaces with genus greater than or equal, greater than one, strictly greater than one. Okay, so this happens in any dimension. So you have a, oh, and this and this uh, compact quotients have an infinite tower of uh, compact coverings. I'll show you some pictures afterwards. So um, you take each one of these of these compact quotient and multiply by the round sphere, okay? And you have another tower of coverings like this. Now you take the metric here, the um, uh, metric that gives you the maximum of the invariant theta 4, and you pull it back. You start pulling it back. And you show that when you pull it back, the energy of this, of this thing goes to 0, okay? Because the volume increases. Uh, but the curvature itself doesn't increase, and you compute this, and then it goes to zero. Okay. And uh, okay, at some point, this energy goes below the energy of a sphere. Okay. But if you're below the energy of a sphere, then that means uh, that um, uh, this pullback cannot give you the maximum, cannot realize the theta four, because the maximum has to be greater than the sphere. So if at some point you're below the sphere. The Oban inequality fails, which means that is not the maximum. So there is another maximum. And so you find another solution of your problem. Okay? And you find it this after a finite number of steps. And then you can iterate this, this thing, because you can now start pulling back this new solution. And then the energy goes to 0, and at some point it becomes less than a sphere. And so it's not the maximum, and then and you do it again. Okay? So this may look to you like a very special situation 
of the, of the hyperbolic space. Like, okay, this is more or less a picture in dimension two. When you have um, uh, hyperbolic surfaces, so you have sigma k, oops, genus k, uh, it covers sigma g whenever there is this right magnetic relations here, and then you have an m sheeted covering. This happens in, in any dimension, not only in dimension two for hyperbolic manifolds, okay? And this is an algebraic property that I actually probably can go a little faster. This depends on the fact that the, okay, having, having compact uh, coverings depends on the fundamental group, okay? Ha depends on having um, uh, normal subgroups having finite index, right? And so if you want to um, do this construction having infinitely many compact coverings, you need a group, you need a fundamental group that has a tunnel, an, a, an infinite tunnel of normal subgroups having finite, uh, finite index, okay? And groups of these types are called, um, okay, they have this property of having the profinite completion infinite. Maybe I should go a little faster than that. Uh, let me just tell you that this is a hard uh, algebraic property to prove, but there is another property which is easier. A group is uh, residually finite if the intersection of all norm normal subgroups having finite indexes is, is, uh, is trivial, okay? If you have a group which is residually finite and infinite, then uh, if, if this is the fundamental group of some compact manifold, then this gives you this infinite tower of things, okay? And it's relatively easy to decide when a group is residually finite because there is a, a theorem, famous theorem by, it's called Sel Selberg uh, Malchev lemma that tells you that if you have a finitely generated linear groups, these are residually finite. Now, pi one is always finitely generated. And uh, if you take a symmetric space and take a compact quotient, then this, uh, the pi one is always a linear group. So symmetric, you can replace the hyperbolic space with any symmetric space. And, that, and the same kind of construction works, okay? So this is, so the theorem actually we prove is slightly more general than the one I showed you. I it tells you that if, if you take a product of anything closed and a symmetric space, then you can find infinitely many uh, complete uh, constant Q curvature solutions in this thing here. Okay, I think I have uh, maybe another 10 minutes? 10 minutes, okay. So um, let me tell you um, now about another type of analysis for this type of problems that we have uh, used. We have used bifurcation theory, okay? Um, we cannot do uh, bifurcation theory in general. We, ne we really need very special assumptions to control the spectral uh, properties of the operators. The spectral properties of the Pinetz operator in its general form are very hard to compute. So we make a, a, a suitable answers to study the problem. And so we need a family of, um, a natural family of, uh, of uh, metrics with constant Q curvature whose Morse index can be computed somehow. And uh, we thought about uh, Riemann and submersions. So we fixed the basis and uh, we consider a family uh, of metrics of this type where this uh, metric should have at the same time constant scalar curvature and Q curvature. Uh, we would like them to have minimal fibers and also we would like this property of being horizontally Einstein. Remember that I told you that the uh, um, Pinetz operator becomes easier when you, when you have a, an Einstein metric, okay? Here we make a slightly weaker assumption. We assume that the metric is a multiple of the Ricci tensor only on the horizontal distribution, let's say, okay? So a typical example of this is, uh, comes from uh, homogeneous vibrations. If you take uh, uh, three compact league groups uh, ha having inclusions of this type, then you can take G mod H, um, uh, projects onto G mod K, and the typical fiber is K mod H, okay? I will give you examples in it. Um, and then you fix, okay, you fix a bi-invariant metric G1 on G, and then they, this gives you metrics here. 
where basically all these assumptions are satisfied. You have to be a little careful about this, but it's usually satisfied. And then the family of metrics is obtained by rescaling the metric of the fibers. You fix the metric of the base, you just rescale the fibers. This is Cheeger deformations. They have a name in literature. Okay? So this is the kind of, of, uh, of situations that we consider. And we prove a theorem, a bifurcation theorem, which now I'll show it to you. And it's not really meant to um, impress you because it's actually rather nasty. But um, I want you to understand that uh, we really use this theorem to make computations. We don't claim to have a, a nice theorem to show, but it's good for making computations. That's what we need. So you take a manifold dimension greater than or equal to 5. You take a one-parameter family of horizontally Einstein Riemannian submersions with the minimum fibers, as I told you. Uh, you assume that the sky curvature and the Q curvature are constant. And then you define these numbers here, okay, which are pretty bad numbers depending on T. And, uh, but now this is the good thing. You fix an eigenvalue of the spectrum of the Laplacian of the base, just one fixed eigenvalue, and you assume that for this fixed eigenvalue, these two equations are satisfied, okay, for some, at some instant T star. Um, this equation tells you that the corresponding solution of the uh, uh, constant Q curvature problem is degenerate. And this equation here tells you that the Morse index jumps at that degenerate point. Okay? So in that case, you have a bifurcation for this. Okay? So this is standard bifurcation theory, nothing too fancy really. Uh, but the thing is that also you can assure that the, in the bifurcation branch, even though the trivial branch has constant scalar curvature, in the bifurcation branch, certainly you don't have constant scalar curvature. Okay? Also, producing examples of metrics having constant Q curvature but non-constant scalar curvature, this is a non-trivial problem. Okay? So, but if you can apply this theorem, you get it for free. You get free examples. And we really managed to, to, uh, prove, uh, to apply this theorem to uh, standard examples, Berger spheres, for instance. So this corresponds to, uh, OK, total space is an uh, um, even dimensional sphere. And uh, the base is uh, CPN, the complex projective space, and the fiber is S1. So as I told you, the Berger metric is uh, you rescale. This is the metric on the vertical distribution in this metric on the horizontal. The horizontal is just the, um, the standard uh, Fubini study metric here. And uh, when t is equal to 1, this is the, the unit round sphere. This corresponds to the homogeneous vibration un plus 1, un, and u1. These are the three groups. Um, this uh, thing here tells you that you really have horizontally Einstein uh, manifolds. Um, and then we find that when n is greater than or equal to 6, we can find a sequence of bifurcation instance going to plus infinity. Okay? So this is strange, usually, because we expected uh, bifurcation when t goes to 0. That means when the fiber collapses. Okay? When the fiber collapses, the scalar curvature explodes. Okay? And when uh, t goes to infinity, the scalar curvature goes to 0. So for the Yamabe problem, usually we obtained bifurcation instance where t goes to 0. Here, is, it's the other way around. It's very surprising. And, um, and in particular, if you make computations when n is between 6 and 9, this is just by a matter of computations, then uh, you do have bifurcating branch where you have negative scalar curvature and negative Q curvature, which means the maximum principle fails very badly. So no uniqueness at all. You would, ex you, you, you would conjecture, for instance, what, that when Q is negative and scalar curvature is negative, then you have uniqueness of a constant Q curvature matrix. Not true. Not true. So you, have, um, um, you can have uh, many solutions. A similar situation also occurs for uh, uh, other Hopf bundles. Uh, totally uh, analogous here. And here the result is that in this case we can find two sequences. Now we also have bifurcation when you go to zero. And again, so we have a sequence of instance, uh, uh, bifurcation instance going to plus infinity, but also going to zero in this case. And again, we, we find examples of uh, uh, 
multiple solutions in conformal classes satisfying these two inequalities here. This is what we were after. We were looking at, we were trying to find examples of this solution here. Um, we also have other examples. I think this is my last, yes, okay, but there's one, something, two things that I want to say. Uh, there are two, two important events in 2018. 18. The first one is, I, I forgot to put here, and it's the School of Differential Geometry. This will be given, Brazilian School of Differential Geometry, February 27, February 27, to March 3rd. This will be in João Pessoa, which is a beautiful city in the northeast of Brazil. So this is the School of Differential Geometry. And then this is the ICM in Rio de Janeiro, August 2018. So, I will see you all both at the School of Differential Geometry and at the ICM. Thank you very much for your attention.